Thank you to the uh, MIC and Institute of Public Health for hosting the meeting. Thank you to the Fondation Merieu for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be to be with you, and thank you all for for attending the um, this uh, this symposium. So I'm going to talk about um, uh, migration and, and and health and equity. That's very much uh, what we're going to talk. We're going to talk about UHC as well, and I come from the perspective of being a researcher working in conflict affected countries. So we're going to talk about uh, for displacement a lot, but migration a lot, and I'm going to try to explain a little bit the challenges we have in the field of migration and health in terms of research and in terms of concept as well, and why we're struggling a little bit making sense of the, um, the situations and the data, or the lack of data. Um, so um, a lot of that, so migration and health is a fantastic, rich um, field of research, and, we've, and the, there's a lot happening. In May this year, we launched a Lancet series in the Lancet Europe, exactly on the same topic, migration, health, and equity, and trying to make sense of what is going on in Europe in terms of UHC, in terms of data, in terms of priority pa pa packages, in terms of um, discrimination, and in terms of solutions as well. So my talk is going to be about the, the challenges displaced population are going to face entering a health system, whatever the health system. But as well, I'm going to give you a few examples of, of solutions. And I think in the panels, you're going to hear more and more illustrative examples of good practice. Um, it is a very sensitive topic, a very politically heavy topic. And you can see in the news, the narratives that we have in many, many countries. These newspapers come from mainly from, from Europe. We have, so I'm talking about the context I know a little bit more about. Um, the, 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 the concept or the narratives like the waves of migrants arriving at the border of Greece and so on. But as well, in, in, in many aspects, without any bad intentions, the fact that we, we show the flows of the movement of populations looking uh, using arrows like people are invading a country and so, and so on to the fact that we decided to uh, create a specific um, uh, training a specific course for journalists so to make sure they understand the weight of their words the weight of their uh, graph and so on so we want to change that and that could be a, a nice course as well to, uh, that you could you could uh, you could create but here we are so we've got the narrative as a researcher working on migration and refugees and for displacement, that is not very much in favor of making more sense and making more transparency and more data on migrants. There's a lot of political pressures that we all have. One billion people today are considered as, as migrants. Okay? But now, if we look at the, the, the field of full displacement, um, uh, um, Dr. Pab this morning, uh, in 2024, we probably estimate 120 million people are today forcibly displaced in the world. Okay. Many of them, what we need to understand as well is that um, uh, many of them are, have a refugee status. So 35 million. What about the rest? Okay. These are the key questions we have in terms of protection of people who are displaced. We talk a lot about people on the move. So it's not only about being displaced from one place to another, but what is going on when people have to move from Beirut to Syria? What is going on on the journey when they have to move from Damascus to Greece, crossing Iran and so on? When they move from Kabul, crossing Iran, Turkey, arriving in Greece, going to the Balkans and then arriving to um, Western Europe and so on. So they, it's not only about when people um, when people move from one place to another, it's also about what is going on when people are on the move. So a lot of clinics and, 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 and interventions are on these aspects. And of course, you can imagine the complexity of doing that. We've got another issue, is that migration is a big word, a big buzzword, but it encompasses a lot of different situations. Um, economic migrations, forced migration, climate-related migration, and so on and so on. So we've got, a, we've got a key problem here, 
And then you can imagine that for each of them, we've got a lot of silos. We know silos in public health and medicine. They exist as well in this field of migration and health. Some people are going to look at health issues. Other people are going to look at health, human rights, and so on, or access to labor or economic or income. And so on and so on. So it's not only you have different silos in health, you've got a lot in this field. People are looking at so many aspects of migration related issues from different disciplines as well. And, and unfortunately, we're not talking to each other. The second aspect is that it's related to the status. Not only migration can take different forms, but it can also generate different statuses. Um, it could be um, asylum seekers, it could be refugees, and you all know that refugee populations have are protected when they're registered. But what, what happened what happen when we talk about internally displaced populations? There's no protection for them, there's no agency in charge of them, and they're falling in between two agencies, IOM and UNHCR. But these two agencies says actually when they are RDPs, they stay in the country, so they should be the, the, under the responsibility of the government, okay? So let's imagine today, for example, I, I'm going to be in Afghanistan in a couple of days, one million people returned from the refugee camps in Pakistan to Afghanistan. And they all go back to their province of origin. And, and of course, this, they are under the responsibility of the government, but you can imagine sometimes in some of the fragile states where health, health systems are underfunded, that they probably need uh, some extra support to making sure that basic services are going to be provided to this kind of population. So we've got a, a huge problem. 60% of people who are displaced are internally displaced populations, not refugees. We talk a lot about refugees. They have a lot of visibility, nothing about IDPs. And, and this is where we need to invest our time and investment. Then people, migrants, are individuals. They are all individuals with their own needs, with their own expectations, with their own life history. So it does mean that when we talk about migrants as such, uh, we simplify a lot the situation of these people. They are individuals, they are family members, so they have many different identities and they have also a different life experience. As an, uh, healthcare providers, this is what exactly you need to take into account. So we've got different former migrations, different statuses, and, and a migrant who does not exist as such as a single group. We've got plenty of individuals who have decided to move from one country to another. And in the case, in the case of my interest, research interest, people who are forced to leave from one country to another or to stay in the country because they want to flee violence or harassment and so on and so on. So let's look at a little bit of other figures. So now we've got. I wanted to very, very much highlight the fact that migrants is very much more than figures, but let's look at a little bit the situation, for example, of refugee populations. We know that the refugee populations, when we talk about refugees, we talk about a lot about violence and armed conflict. Not only about armed conflict, violence is much broader than that. As soon as you are a political uh, opponent you have, and, and you demonstrate you are harassed or under threat, in your country, you can ask for protection, okay, outside the country. So of course, we've got a, a clear, a clear situation in 2022. The map is going to be very different today in in uh, in uh, with uh, the, the situation in the Middle East, for example. What we know about refugee populations is that when they flee their country, first of all, they flee internally, their their residence, and then they go to neighboring countries. So if we have Josette on, 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 on the line to, um, calling us from Lebanon, 25% of the population in, Liban, in Lebanon are Syrian refugees, 1.5 million people. And still they are registered. We don't count the unregistered people. So can you imagine here this country receiving the equivalent of 25% of the American population and the health system has to deal with that? 
Okay. So we know that refugee population, they go to neighboring countries. And that's a, that's a clear fact. Myanmar, the largest refugee camp in the world today is in Cox Bazar in Bangladesh uh, at, the, at the border with Myanmar. So people are staying there in the neighboring countries, hoping they can cross the border again and go back home. Where we have, where we have, um, sorry, I pass that. Where we have as well on the top of that, and that this is what very, very important, and that's relative, relatively new situation, climate or induced, climate induced migration. And as you can see, we can put the two maps between conflict and, and disasters, and actually there's a big match. So not only people are going to flee the conflict, but as well, they need to, conf they need to flee um, uh, the, um, the uh, disaster. It could be earthquake, uh, Haiti, it could be flooding, it could be uh, a, a lot of issues, or uh, we, we have a lot of situations that's related to conflict, but we have a, a, lo a lot of situation in different parts of the world. Wildfires in Canada, the, the sea level rise in, uh, in, uh, in the Fijis and all this area. So these create new situations, and today it's a big question mark for everybody, not for healthcare providers, but in terms of protection. What do we do? What kind of protection can we offer to these populations? This is simply an evolution of how we moved from ref the, the, the distribution between IDPs and refugee populations. And as you can see now, 60% uh, of the displaced population, forcibly displaced population, are IDPs. They stay in the country, but they move from one place to another. You could say, not an issue. Look, let's look at Iraq today. You've got a lot of Arabic populations who left the south, around Baghdad, to go to the Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan, same country, but such a different system, health system, different language, different, different culture, and so on and so on. And today, there are a lot of tensions between displaced Iraqis from the south and the Kurdish populations. So here we are. So that's it. And this is a situation we don't talk about. And us, as researchers, we do not document that. We have a responsibility as well to do more research on IDPs. Now, let's talk about the, 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 the health issues. Typically, we talk a lot about infectious diseases. That's right. They are, they're listed here. That's very important. This is why, systematically, there are a lot of um, vaccination programs in place. This has been done systematically uh, for refugees coming from Ukraine, in Greece, in Turkey, and so on, in Turkey, sorry. And, and, but also, I want to highlight today other issues related to NCDs, mental health issues, but as well injuries and trauma and violence. I want to talk about NCDs because it's probably one of the most complex health interventions we can offer to displaced populations. You need to ensure continuum of care and continuity of care, as you know that these people are going to move from one place to another. How do you do that? How do you do that when they move from one province to another? And when do you do that? When they cross a border. Let's imagine the complexity of the healthcare professionals trying to understand the, the, the medical history of the person when these people arrive in your clinic, in your health center. When we talk about the health needs of displaced populations, is we need to have a clear, a clear vision that it is at every step or every stage of their journey. And this is, this is very important. And for each step of their journey, you're going to have a very different health intervention. Some of them are going to be more comprehensive than, than others. Some are going to focus on infectious diseases, vaccination and preventions. And then as soon as people are going to start settling down, then you can really start mental health programs and so on more in the long term to ensure continue, continue of care. But knowing that all these stages uh, can be very temporary and very, very short, us as healthcare providers, we need to be more agile. 
And this is what happened in, in Europe, for example, when people were crossing borders from, from Pakistan or from Damascus to go to, uh, to arrive in Greece, when actually they, they had some, a, a lot of um, clinics on the way. And this happened as well on, on the beast, for example, in Mexico, where on the train you had a lot of MSF and Red Cross clinic at different uh, uh, um, uh, stages, and people could get access to care uh, on the way. And that's important for us because it does, it does require to rethink about what primary health care is about or what emergency, emergency care is about. It's not only about behind this building, it's also about these mobile clinics or these um, uh, very much outreach activities we can put in place. When we talk about um, migration, and we have a lot of narrative again about um, migrants are going to bring all the infectious diseases in our country, there's a huge risk. Um, they, I mean, that's not correct. All these aspects are related to their living conditions. And we did a lot of, there's a lot of evidence on that, on, on the fact that actually, if you invest on providing good living conditions in terms of hygiene, shelter, and food and diet, we talk a lot about uh, nutrition, that's, that's the, their, their living conditions and their health is going to improve. And of course, it, it is a political um, decision, and that's, that's very important. But we have a lot of uh, evidence now that actually improving their living conditions of migrants and refugees is actually a fantastic investment in order to, and very cost-effective, to um, make sure that uh, people, uh, when they arrive in the healthcare system, and usually in ER, in emergency services, actually, uh, we can save a lot of money for the system, but as well, is going to improve the health status of populations. Of course, we know there are plenty of barriers, and we have listed quite a few here. Uh, these, these could be could come from the system, from the structure, from the rights, getting access, what kind of rights do you have? What is, when you talk about UHC, you've got your cube of UHC. What is uh, the package you can get access to? Is it only about vaccinations, emergency care, or is it uh, broader than that? We know that, and, and today in France, they want to remove lead medical d'urgence, which is the basic package you offer to homeless people, migrant people, and so on. We know that if we remove that, it's going to cost seven times more to their national health system because people are going to arrive to emergency rather than having access to primary health care system. And there are some challenges related to language, related to culture as well. We all have different perspectives on illness, on diseases, and so on. And it, it, it does mean that, for example, depending on your culture, you might delay getting access to healthcare professionals. We all know that. Language is another one. And as well, the, 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 the concern on discrimination. And we also know on the supply side that there is discrimination and racism from some of the healthcare professionals. And it does mean that in this kind of schools and institutes, there's more and more that we need to, 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 to teach about. It's very much about equitable access and discrimination and making sure that this not, doesn't happen anymore. Very quickly about, about the, 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 when we want to shape or design a program or, or a health system that is um, uh, very much focusing on, on migrants, or is going to include migrants. We're not saying um, uh, um, very, very much focusing on migrants. This is a perspective of national health systems, where the key question you're going to ask is, OK, how much is that going to cost? Who's going to get access to it? And what kind of package are they going to get access to? But what we see more and more from the healthcare professional perspective is very much about a different perspective. And that's happening a lot. Even if there's a lot of legislation policies against migration in Europe, at the, at the lower level, healthcare providers in many, many countries are doing a lot. And they do that with this perspective about where should I deliver the services? As hospital, certainly not. They don't know where we are, but they go to communities. Uh, how am I going to ensure continuum of care and continue, continue, continuity of care as well? 
And this is what's happening, and this is where many healthcare providers uh, on the ground are applying. Uh, are, uh, applying. If we want to, and that is my, 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 almost my, uh, my last message is, when we want to design a patient center or Magon center health system, it's not only about healthcare providers and what we can offer, it's also about policies. And that's important as well. So we need to work at all the different levels of the system with um, um, uh, civil society organizations, national health system, private sector, and so on and so on. But as well, trying to remove all the legal and policy barriers that could exist uh, in, in the country or regionally. And that's very important. And of course, on the demand side and the supply side, there's a lot we need to invest on about making sure that migrants are going to trust the system, making sure that when they get access to the system, they will not be discriminated. One key group of populations we never talk about because there's no data about them, but they do exist everywhere, undocumented migrants. Some people are going to call them illegal migrants. So officially for us, they are undocumented migrants. And this is a key problem for us. They are in every country. The problem, there is no data. And we don't know about the rights for them to get access to services. So it's a key issue in Europe, for example, but in many, many countries, I'm, very, I'm pretty sure, uh, about what kind of services they can get access in terms of vaccinations and, and primary health care. And my, my final word is very much about what we see in Europe more and more is that criminalization of reporting is said, is, is seen more and more. What does that mean? Is that if you're a healthcare professional is a system, in many, many countries, you have the obligation to report who is going to get access to your clinic. So what we advocate for is a separation between the police and the healthcare system. And that's important if you want to make sure that migrants refugees and undocumented migrants are going to trust the system. And finally, the Lancet migration is a community of researchers. And we do a lot to connect all researchers who want to work in the system. If you are in your master degree, if you are doing a PhD or senior researcher, what we're trying to do is that we are not enough researchers working on these issues. So we're trying to connect all these researchers together in order to value what you publish and what you document and make make these populations more visible and i stop here thank you